Uh, who serves that? Christ, the price on that fish. What, has the ocean evaporated or something? Uh, hey, I'm, uh, I'm at a dinner right now. Uh, so, uh, not really a great time, if I'm going to be honest. Uh, and there's definitely better ways to get my attention, might I add, staring me down like that, like I'm ready to just burst into a history lesson every two seconds. I mean, honestly, what with COVID and global warming and carbon emissions, general poverty, an overwhelming disdain to avoid public situations or eat alone, or my severe distaste for steak, it's been way too long since I've gone out and had a nice juicy steak, rare if you don't mind. A hot minute is how I'd describe it. Seriously, it has been forgotten. My dinner's been forgotten uh, by the guy who's supposed to serve it to me. No, look, I'll give it to you. That is rare. Okay, so the Nintendo 64 was my jam. Not only did developers have an entire additional dimension to work with, but the graphics were still complete garbage, so all the focus was on creativity and gameplay. For many developers, this simply meant staying faithful to the games we'd seen before, just in a 3D space. Hell, some games didn't even do that. And don't get me wrong, this definitely wasn't a bad thing. The Nintendo 64 was home to some of the most pure and classic gimmick-free experiences of all time because of it. For the most part, the transition from 2D to 3D was plenty innovative as is, without having to make any major leaps and bounds. Looking at you, GameCube. One company, however, could tell that the third dimension was here to stay, going the extra mile to step above the rest and really use 3D to their advantage. That company was, of course, rare, and while nowadays they may sadly only really be known for... Well... The years of 1996-2001 were their golden age. After impressing Nintendo with their work on Donkey Kong Country, it was tough to own a Nintendo 64 without somehow ending up with a Rare game in your collection. Rare had a tendency to innovate, and the sheer variety of games they made for the N64 alone is astounding. Within a year, Rare went from perfecting the N64 FPS to pretty much inventing and also perfecting the modern-day collectathon. Rare had an impact on everyone who owned a Nintendo 64, myself included, with Diddy Kong Racing, one of the most creative kart racers of all time. So, hey, seeing as I'm here in this restaurant, waiting for my meal again, I might as well use this time to tell you all a story. So, take a seat, pour yourself a drink, get comfortable, and pour another drink, you're gonna need it. Especially if I'm gonna be telling you about the most inventive kart racer ever made, and how that meddling Nintendo ruined its legacy, and any chance it had at a sequel. Which, which I am, yeah, that's the story. Sit down, f*** up. Admittedly, I initially chose to do this video because I thought it would be a bit of a write-off as I knew I'd already started scripting it some time ago, uh, but I also thought my notes would be a little bit more extensive than just palm trees make a funny sound when you drive into them. So here's that. Back when I thought I had more than just that though, I started to remember just how much I used to love this game, so now I'm doing it anyway, write-off or not. If we want to get to the bottom of what exactly went wrong with Diddy Kong Racing as a franchise, first we need to know everything that made the original so fantastic. And I mean everything. Excellent. The way I see it, Diddy Kong Racing was able to capture the two major demographics of Nintendo 64 owners that no other racer could. Lonely people and fans of Rare games. Diddy Kong Racing was the only Rare game I owned at the time, so I hope that narrows down my case a bit. The point is, Diddy Kong Racing was a very unique breed of racing game, with two major advantages on its side over the, hot take, wildly inferior Mario Kart 64. First of all, cars f***ing reek. Seriously Mario, get your act together, you've got three dimensions now, the sky's the limit. Look at this, you see this? Streets behind. In Diddy Kong Racing, nowhere is off limits. If you want to drive your car into the sea, then guess what? It's all light blue, baby. You can do it. But you probably shouldn't. Let's be real, cars aren't exactly made for water. Or sometimes land, it would seem. But hovercrafts are. Yep, that's right. Diddy Kong's loaded lineup, ladies. The guy's even got a private plane, too. Nowhere is safe from the wrath of Diddy. See, so yeah, unlike any other racing game of the time, you weren't just confined to the one vehicle, but one of three, all of which are incredibly different to play, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. 
The tried and true car is about what you'd expect. Uh, four wheels and goes, I suppose. The hovercraft has one major advantage over the car, being that it can drive on both land and water. And lava, somehow, is very durable. It is, however, much harder to manoeuvre, with a tendency to drift all over the shop and sort of wander to France if you take your eyes off the screen for even a second. Hell, it can't even drift, just more sort of hop to readjust trajectory on the fly. Which is a little bit weird at first, but absolutely crucial to mastering the hovercraft. And finally, you have the plane, which flies. No sh**. It's also quite difficult to control, impossible to hit other opponents with, and small openings are its downfall. Obviously though, it does allow for plenty of really great shortcut opportunities that other vehicles simply don't. You can also do this barrel roll sort of thing, which I never use, but hey, it looks useful enough if you actually remember it even exists. As well as this loop-de-loop -loop move you can do that basically has no tactical advantage. If anything, it probably slows you down, but if you never pop off one of these right as you're about to pass the finish line, then I don't think we'd be very good friends. And this isn't like some dodgy 52% GDA transform race where everyone starts in the same vehicle and changes throughout the lap. No, you pick a vehicle at the start and you stick with it for the rest of the race. You made your car backseat bed, now lie in it! That's not to say you can just take any vehicle into any course, of course. You obviously won't be able to take a car into an entirely water-based track, that's ridiculous, someone mod it. But most offer some sort of option, which is fantastic. Hell, you can even mix and match in multiplayer. Is it fair? F*** no. But it's sure as hell fun! But what's the point of owning personal transport if you can't equip it with a rocket launch or a 10 on the fly? Well, with balloons, now you can! Simply pop a red balloon to equip rockets, a blue balloon for an extra boost, a green for an oil slick, and a yellow for the good old force field. You like that? You like those power-ups? What if I power up your power-ups? Run on through another balloon of the same colour to level it up once, and do it again to arm yourself with enough firepower to realise why it's such a great system. Take red balloons for example. The first will net you a green shell style rocket, again to turn into a homing missile, and once more to split it into ten. This all sounds very chaotic and overpowered, and that's because it definitely is, but only if you can get your power up to that point. Unlike Mario Kart, collecting a different coloured balloon will replace the one that you currently have, whether you use it or not. It doesn't seem like much, but it creates this really great risk-reward system. You know, do I use the item I have now while there's an opening, or should I wait to pick it up and risk accidentally picking up a different item? Again, not much, but even such a small ounce of strategy is very welcome in my book. Now, I'm gonna jump back to that whole multiple vehicles thing, one of which should be a segue because that's what I'm about to do. These vehicles basically allow not only every corner of every level to be accessed, thereby eliminating out-of-bounds areas entirely, but also allow every level to be viewed from any angle. Because of this, each track has a lot more to account for, visually speaking, so there isn't any clever graphical illusion or sprite trickery to be found. What you see is what you see. Everything in the world is completely modelled, and it looks fantastic. Compare this to Mario Kart 64 where so much of the game is made up of 2D sprites and it generally just has a lot more depth and looks much less... flat. In the end, it all contributes to the game's almost comically bright and happy art style that you can't not fall in love with. All of the characters look like they've been pulled straight from a cutesy children's cartoon too, which definitely isn't helped by the super endearing intro that introduces them all one by one. I mean, just look at the character select screen. Everyone's dancing, the music changes as you hover over the different characters. It is so f***ing happy, it makes me want to f***ing chuck. It is the best first impression money can buy, and I love it. Oh, and speaking of characters, the variety on offer here is pretty interesting. Original characters include those such as Pipsy the Mouse, Bumper the Badger, and the true MVP of the game, Timber the Tiger, who sounds both five years old and perpetually angry at the world. So in other words, my spirit animal. You've also got these two NPC characters, Taj the Indian Elephant, who basically acts as your guide throughout the game, who won't stop screaming. Shut up! My particular favourite, however, is this giant sentient clock named TT, who literally only exists to act as the mascot and physical embodiment of the time trial game mode. Like, that's so cool! I mean, not really, he doesn't do that much to make time trials any more exciting, but Mario Kart's never had a character like that, so it's so cool! Just don't honk at him, he doesn't like that very much. No, no, no TT, no, no! But most characters on offer were direct representations of some of Rare's most well-known games. Or should I say, soon to be well known, as Conker, Banjo and Tip Top were yet to actually appear in any games outside of Diddy Kong Racing prior to its release. 
This is actually because Diddy Kong Racing originally started out as an entirely original racing game called Pro AM64, with completely original characters and supposedly no relation to the rare developed NES game of almost the same name. At the same time, Banjo-Kazooie was slated to be Rare's big Christmas release, but was pushed back to release the year after in order to polish it even further, leaving Pro AM64 as their only viable holiday release. There were doubts circulating at Rare as to whether or not this new IP would be strong enough to capture the attention of consumers during such a pivotal release window, however. So in the end, all of the characters were replaced by Rare's biggest upcoming characters, pushing all the original Pro AM characters to the sidelines, including the main character, Timber the Tiger. Well, at least we know why he's so upset half the time now. It's so charming and it really makes me wish we could have another game like this. At least so we could see Birdless Banjo and Alcoholismless Conquer side by side once more. And while we're on the topic of charm, you can't not mention the music. Because, oh man, is it something else. Not even kidding, you could list me any track from this game and I could hum it in full 1080p music OST open square bracket extended close square bracket. Except Boulder Canyon. I can't stand the music in that track. Not that it's bad or anything, it just, it just feels condescending. I, alongside the rest of humanity, have a really soft spot for those classic N64 sound fonts. If I had to describe them in one word, it would be... Chunky. Yep, that's Chunky, that's the one. And there isn't a single track in this game that isn't the epitome of Chunk. The music here is easily one of the best parts of the game, and basically every track's a bop in its own special way, so I definitely recommend having a listen to some of it in your own spare time. Uh, okay, um, well, I was gonna do a little sample of all the best music tracks, but unfortunately it turns out they're all the best. And I'm looking at the runtime and it's it's pretty dicey. So like, let's just, we're gonna have to play them all at once, I guess. So, you know, here, try this. All right, but let's stop beating around the bush because we all know where this is going. Diddy Kong Racing, Smoking Tailpipe, The Adventure Mode. What Rare has basically done with this is not only provide a really substantial single player offering, but also add a relatively solid story that has a bit more to offer than just playing four Grand Prix over and over. A story which goes a little something like this. Alright, so Diddy's lifelong friend Timber, who we've only just heard about now, I guess, uh, is into real estate, or at least his parents are anyway, because they own an island. It must be a pretty sh** place to live though, because they've left him there alone to go on vacation somewhere else. Now, Whizpig, the very evil, very established, barely wizard, barely pig, has invaded the island, leaving Diddy and his friends to defeat him and save the day. To be fair, though, I don't blame Whizpig for trying to take the island at all, uh, considering there's a gigantic rock sculpture of his face right in the middle of it. Of course he's going to think it's his right to take it. But, you know, story and all, whatever, whatever, flying, politically incorrect, Indian elephant, guide and bingo, banjo, you got a story, that'll do. That's the abridged version, anyway. The actual story in the instruction manual is much more detailed and, frankly, eloquent in a very strange way. I mean, read this line. After Diddy Kong carefully read the note through a couple more times, he sat back and gnawed on a finger, his gaze fixed somewhere beyond the early morning jungle mist. Like, what the f***? 
Just for the record, I am man enough to admit that it took me more than a few minutes to figure out that the word finger was referring to a banana and not an actual finger. But I'm also man enough to admit that I definitely prefer thinking that I'm wrong. Anyway, look, it's very odd. Go track it down. In the end, though, the intricacies of the story don't really matter, but the fact that it exists at all does. Having not only a plot, but an entirely dedicated adventure mode not only provides a really great single-player offering that isn't quite as shallow as just aimlessly racing over and over again, but also a reason to race in the first place. It provides an incentive to race, so you can fight the bosses, then get your ass wiped by them, and never progress in the story ever because it's too damn difficult. Yep, it's got bosses. So basically, the Hub World Adventure Mode contains four doors to four uniquely themed worlds. You got Dino Domain, your jungle desert dead things hybrid, Snowflake Mountain, the Christmassy snowy world, Sherbet Island, the pirate inspired water zone, and Dragon Forest, the village forest mashup. There's also a fifth unlockable world, Future Funland, entirely themed around the Good Timelines 2015. I don't care that it's unlockable, the game's been out for 25 years now. It's the best world of the lot, and I'm sick of pretending it doesn't exist just to preserve the magic. Alright, so let me break it down a bit. Every world is broken up into four courses, each based around the world's central theme. Simply come first in all of them to unlock the boss door. Once inside, you'll face one of the four bosses, Tricky the Triceratops, Bubbler the Octopus, Smokey the Dragon, and Bluey the Walrus, who is my favourite, he's very dapper and I like the way he talks. If you can beat me again, I'll give you a special prize! In fact, I like the way everyone talks in this game, because it is of course blessed with full voice acting. Sorry to break the party worms, but I had to say goodbye! It's never very good, uh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I am the genie of the island. Pair that with the subpar sound quality and dodgy animations, and you've got the epitome of Nintendo 64 charm right here. I love it to bits. After beating each boss once, which is no joke, might I add, you'll be tasked with going back to their respective world and coming first again while collecting all eight silver coins scattered around the track. Actually finding these coins is usually pretty simple, as the real challenge comes from how you're going to collect them all and still make good time, especially when some of them are super out of the way or place in downright impossible shortcuts. This is definitely the part of the game I remember struggling with the most when I was younger, and I definitely have to admit that I still struggle just as much, if not more, here. However, that being said, I did enjoy it a lot. Bar Frosty Village, which ironically melted my brain out of pure frustration, all of the silver coin challenges were perfectly doable, challenging, very, but a really satisfying challenge that rewards you for really getting the hang of each vehicle. Anyway, if you can manage to get through all of that, you'll be able to challenge each boss a second time, but if they weren't funny the first time, then they're bloody dismal the second. Tricky and Bluey aren't that bad, they're tough sure, but it's a pretty standard race for the most part. Bubbler and Smokey though? I haven't seen it. That's the one about the pop fueled buddy cops, right? But the Diddy Kong Racing bosses of the same name are pretty good depressants too. On top of having to deal with these incredibly fast bosses in the two most finicky vehicles in the game, you also have to do so while avoiding either bubbles or flames dropped around each track by the pair that basically screw up your entire run if you bump into either. Easily the two hardest pre whiz pig bosses in the entire game, and if you ask anyone what the hardest part of this game was for them as a child, chances are you'll either get the octopus or dragon boss as an answer, myself included. Much like the silver coin challenges, however, as much as I remember struggling with these bosses, there's nothing more satisfying than that perfect run when you finally manage to beat them. Because in the end, it's all skill. It's your time that you've put into master the vehicles, map out the tracks in your head, and put it all together into one perfect run. It's a real challenge, sure, but it's a completely fair challenge at that. I'm gonna flame grill whiz pig and put him on a sandwich. Holy hell, I take it all back. Bubbler and Smokey are my best friends, and I can't believe I would ever say anything like that about them. Damn it. Shit. Oh, for God's sake. Oh my God. You've got to be kidding me. Oh, Wizpig, why? What did I ever do to you? For God's sake, just leave me alone. Hi, this is a tutorial on how to destroy your perfectly good, fully functional Nintendo 64. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. Oh, look, it's bubbles. Okay, so Wizpig. Once you beat all the bosses for the second time, you'll be able to enter the Wizpig statue and face Wizpig for the first time and. Oh boy. Hope you're a fan of precision driving and upmarket snacks, because the only way you're going to be able to beat this guy is with some crazy muscle memory and a massive side of cheese. Unlike the other bosses where it's all about catching up and staying in front, Wizpig's race is more about staying behind and edging out at just the right moment, mainly because you don't really have a choice. Wizpig is about twice the speed of you, and the only way you'll be able to get in front is by memorizing the exact locations of every boost pad on the track and hitting every single one, every single time. And that's not even really a tip or anything. Half the time if you miss him, you're gonna end up off-roading or in the water, practically jeopardizing any chance you had at winning that run anyway. 
Even if you manage to hit every zipper, there's no guarantee you'll win the race. Why? I don't know, sometimes the hog's just too fast. All the characters in this game have completely hidden stats as well, some of which are genuinely just worse than others. One such character is Timber the Tiger, the very same character I've been playing as the entire game so far. After switching to a slightly faster character, I was definitely doing a little bit better, but still not enough to get even close. That's when I discovered... Okay, so whether by intention or not, there are a handful of tricks you can use in Diddy Kong Racing that Rare doesn't want you to know about. The first trick is actually told to you by Targe part way into the game, so I guess I'm wrong there. You want to hear the tip or not? About half a second before you hit a zipper. That's it. Shh, 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 shh. Keep it down. Keep it down. Just let it go. Let go of A. Look at the difference. It's crazy. It's crazy. So while well, the last tip was all about letting go of A, this one's about assaulting it. When you're using a car, tap A. Just tap it, over and over. I don't know how, but it's, uh, it's faster than accelerating normally. No, don't, don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger who you didn't hear anything from. You don't know me. Anyway, I beat Whizpig now. The fact that I had to pull out the entire goddamn cheese platter to beat him is probably not a great sign, though. Compared to all the other challenging aspects of this game, Whizpig's race is probably a bit more on the... Dream. ...side. But what is satisfying is that we can finally go to future Funland. After some quick partying and a credit sequence ending with a question mark, you can go ahead and complete the four Grand Prix style trophy races in each world to enter the lighthouse and fly to space. No time to explain them on a roll. Do a few more races, silver coin challenges, and one final trophy race up there to unlock the door to the final boss. Just kidding! Whoa, I forgot about the battle tracks! In every world aside from Future Funland, you'll be able to find a big gold key hidden in one of the races. Once collected, you can use it to unlock a big gold door, or rather force it open, seeing as it starts turning before it even makes it in the keyhole. Behind each of these doors is a four-player battle track themed around its respective world. And just while I'm here, I've totally forgotten to actually talk about the themes, or rather, why they're so good. Having multiple tracks under a specific theme, like snowy or tropical, allows for some really great depth that you just wouldn't find in something like Mario Kart, which usually only has one fairly surface-level snowy desert or tropical track per game. If, for instance, Snowflake Mountain, an entire world themed around snow, allows for Diddy Kong Racing to experiment with a track that feels like a mountain expedition, as well as another that's set in a snow-covered village. Or how the forest theme of Dragon Forest allows for both a regular village track and a haunted village track. It really feels like you're exploring the established world of Timbers Island, like every track is part of a longer journey. It's what makes the trophy races in this game feel so much more cohesive than Mario Kart's Grand Prix ever could. It's like one giant road trip all around the island, from Washington to Florida, right down to the animals taking up half the road. It's a balloon! But right, the battle tracks. They're pretty good too. You've got the Capture the Flag style Fire Mountain, the Elimination Balloon Battle before it was Eviscerated style Icicle Pyramid and Darkwater Beach, and the Banana Running Smoky Castle, the latter of which is definitely my favourite. To win, you need to collect 10 bananas, carrying no more than two at a time, and bring them back to your chest atop the castle. It's a bit of simple chaos that usually devolves into everyone targeting everyone else to the point where nobody's even collecting bananas anymore. Ah, it's great fun. Icicle Pyramid is definitely a close second though, with its multi-leveled maze-like structure where you usually spend more time finding someone to attack than actually attacking anyone. All in all, the battle mode is great fun whether you're playing with friends or not. And the best part is that once you finish first in all four, you'll finally be able to face Whizpig again. If the first time was anything to go by, my expectations are not exactly... Uh, huh. Ugh. Ugh, well. Now I look like a real piece of shit, don't I? As it turns out, the final face-off against Whizpig isn't exactly what I'd expect after the first race, but I'm more than okay with that. This race is definitely a lot more technical, with the existence of items, for one, including a sneakily placed and very crucial force field balloon right before the laser-filled throne room. It's much more tactical than the first, and much more reliant on skill and planning than cheap tricks. The actual track it takes place on is easily the most substantial of all the boss tracks so far as well, and I'm actually pretty annoyed you can't race on it normally. All in all, it's a satisfying cap with just the right amount of challenge to a very fun journey that could easily be described in exactly the same way. Plus, you get a cheat code you can enter on the cheats menu every time you watch the credits, so if you ever wanted to play Adventure Mode in 2-player, change all the horn sounds to mouth sounds, <laughs> or just be slightly larger, then cheat codes can facilitate you. I smoke my stogie anywhere I want. I don't have to find a hideout place like you. What is your favourite line in all of your movies to deliver? <laughs> um, well, when I in uh, 
uh, uh, predator, uh, you know, stuck the guy with a knife through the chest, and they say, Get ready! Yeah! You, know, and, uh, and, uh, you got any more? You... Timber! Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh oh! <laughs> Aesthetic and racing, for the Nintendo 64 anyway. It was an amazing game, and I'm definitely not alone in thinking that, at least if sale numbers were anything to go by, so naturally, a sequel should have been all but guaranteed. Holy sh**, what is wrong with the passage of time in this place? How long does it take someone to cook a goddamn steak? Over the course of the next few years, there were more than a few ideas circulating for potential Diddy Kong Racing sequels and spin-offs in the works. Projects included Donkey Kong Racing, which eventually evolved into Sabermen Stampede, self-described as GTA but with animals, I think even cares anyway, it was cancelled in the end. A Game Boy title called Diddy Kong Pilot, which eventually became Banjo Pilot, so long story short, no longer has anything to do with Diddy Kong Racing. Climax Studios, the game behind a handful of Silent Hill games, even pitched their own sequel, Diddy Kong Racing Adventure, which of course never went anywhere, which may well be for the best if the small amount of footage available is anything to go by. Timber was even supposed to have his own game called Dinosaur Planet at some point, but was booted completely and replaced with Star Fox. For God's sake, Timber had two chances to have his own game and he was shunned by Nintendo both times. Holy hell, I'm sorry, Timber. Point is, Diddy Kong Racing is dead. The problem though, if you haven't figured it out already, is that Rare's story wasn't without its hiccups. As game development costs grew, Nintendo refused to provide Rare with the assistance they needed, so they were forced to sell themselves to Microsoft in 2002. This not only forcibly canned the sequel that was actually in the works at the time, but basically refused Diddy Kong Racing from ever appearing on Virtual Console, what with two rival companies each now owning half the rights. It must have been clear to Nintendo that they just let a perfect hit swing them by, which is why in 2007 they worked with Rare one final time to release Diddy Kong Racing DS for the Nintendo SD. Ah, DS. Shit. By exploiting a few clever loopholes, Nintendo was allowed to enlist the help of Rare to work on the remake, so long as they were back at Mummy Microsoft's in time for tea. What they weren't allowed to do, however, was touch it without f***ing everything up. At least that's what the general consensus on this remake would seem to dictate. If you aren't down to emulate, then at first glance, Diddy Kong Racing DS sounds like it would be a fantastic way to experience an improved classic on a more accessible system, albeit with a few seemingly minor changes and additions. And if the entire game wasn't such a masterclass in how to ruin fun, then I'd probably have to agree. I actually played the DS port quite some time ago, and I sort of remember enjoying my time with it, but even then, it was well after the last time I'd played the original. So I figured that if I really wanted to determine whether or not Diddy Kong Racing DS is truly the better option, I would need to play them both. Back to back, over the course of 48 hours, and it was hell. I was dumb. It is not a good game. Thank you for watching. Hmm, well, uh, gotta start somewhere, I suppose. Okay, so remember the original with its fantastic opening sequence, character intro, video, and selection screens? Yeah, remember how all those wise, knowledgeable people said that it was the best first impression money could buy? Enough said, let's move on. Oh my god, no, I take it back. I want to go back. What have they done to you? My sweet boy! Alright, power through. Power through. <clears throat> okay, alright. So as you may already notice, major change number one, the menus. Yes, they look awful. Both the character and track select screens have been reduced to the most basic, uninspired 2D smatterings they could cobble together in an afternoon. A huge shame when compared to the much more immersive, fun to look at menus the original gave us. Hell, the music doesn't even change anymore as you hover over the different characters, which leads me to major change number two, the roster. During Microsoft's Rare buyer in 2002, Rare retained the rights to all their characters, while Nintendo retained the rights to the original Diddy Kong Racing code. That's why Diddy Kong Racing DS was able to be made in the first place. That being said, Banjo and Conker were of course casualties of this, having been sadly replaced by Tiny Kong and Dixie Kong. Another casualty also appears to have been the entire voice acting budget, with all Adventure Mode VA entirely absent. I'm calling the authorities. My absolute favourite part of it all though is that all the voice acting that is here sounds like it was done by the same guy pinching his nose slightly harder for each character. Hi, I'm Bixby. Hello, I'm Tip Top. Hi, I'm Diddy. Hi, my name's Bumper. Hi, I'm Crunch. Oh, right, and yeah, I almost forgot. Uh, Timber's Australian now. Hi, I'm Timber. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, uh, to you anyway, but to someone like me who's gone the entire life knowing the sarcastic, hot-tempered baby from the original. Wow!
Uh, it's basically the end of the world. Uh, thanks for letting me share. Even Taj, the Indian elephant, Abracadabra. is no longer Indian. So now it's just politically incorrect in a completely different way. I mean, is anything sacred anymore? First the intro, then the menus, then the f***ing elephant. You might also notice that there are four unlockable characters on the selection screen here. You may also notice how most of them aren't unlocked. Guess why? Two of these are Drumstick and TT, who were also unlockable in the first game, as well as Taj and Wizpig, new to DS, who you unlock for completing Adventure Mode and the Mirror Mode Adventure 2, respectively. Speaking of, why don't we dive into Adventure Mode and see what's wrong here? Before Story Mode even starts, we're greeted with the next biggest difference, that of course being the inclusion of a story at all. Unlike the original where you had to read the manual to figure out whether you're on LSD or not, DS actually includes a pretty robust cutscene that explains pretty much everything. What's shown here is actually pretty faithful to the original manual's poetry, so props to that, not a bad change. Easily the most exciting addition though is Taj's tent, located in the Adventure Hub world where his big terrifying face was in the original. From this tent, you'll be able to access the Wish menu, which contains a butt-ton of really cool unlockables. From simple cosmetic stuff like the ability to change your vehicle's colour, or record a custom sound using the built-in mic, which, yes, is as revolutionary as it sounds, to much more substantial stuff like basic performance upgrades, the battle tracks, coin challenges, or even four completely original tracks, entirely unique to the DS version. I mean, hey, maybe this version ain't so bad after all. I don't know why I'm saying that. You, you full well know it's gonna get worse like two paragraphs down. To actually unlock all of that stuff, you'll be using, and wait for it, coins, which are scattered all around every track in adventure mode. I mean, come on, Mario Kart, take notes. This is how you use coins in a racing game. You know, actually letting me spend them these coins do replace bananas though, which is very depressing. I'm so sad, I'm crying. Why the bananas we have? It's just some things I want to keep the same, but I can't. It won't let me, they won't let me, Nintendo won't let me. Like, I'm not really sure why they didn't just use the bananas as currency rather than outright replacing them. Uh, but you know, fine, whatever, I can get past it. You may remember a couple paragraphs ago though, back when I said it was about to get bad right about now, that I casually mentioned that both the Battle Tracks and Silver Coin Challenges, two of the most integral parts of the classic Diddy Kong Racing gameplay loop, have now been relegated to the Wish menu and therefore no longer unlock during regular gameplay, which, yes, is a bad thing, but I'll get to that later. As far as the battle modes go though, their exclusion from the main gameplay loop has one of the most brutal side effects imaginable. You can't play them in single player. One of the most genuinely entertaining, chaotic parts of the original game, and they're completely blocked off unless you have a group of friends to play them with. You can't select them from the track select screen. You can't even access them in adventure mode. Why not? No jokes here, I'm just mad. If this were how it was dealt in the original, I could maybe justify that seeing as the Nintendo 64 is such a multiplayer forward system. Whereas a DS, is not. Setting up multiplayer on this thing is much more painful than it should be and everyone else has to have their own system to play on, so it just doesn't feel natural. Now I wasn't able to find anyone who wanted to play Diddy Kong Racing DS, need I explain why? So I wasn't actually able to test the battle modes myself. If this blurry hand recorded footage from 2013, entirely in Spanish, aka the only known footage of this game's battle mode is anything to go by though, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and I'll say that it's exactly the same, no better, no worse. Of course with the added caveat of not being able to f***ing play it. There's no excuse Nintendo, no excuse. Strike one. As for the silver coin challenges, I mean they're the silver coin challenges. They're fine, but I didn't play them that much, mainly because I didn't have to. Despite being so difficult, the silver coin challenges felt like a natural part of adventure mode's progression, so you better hope that whatever replaced it was something really worthwhile. Good God! Somehow, as I played my way through this dodge sedan of a port, I failed to remember that this game was primarily developed by Nintendo, so any regular gameplay had to be offset with eight layers of gimmick. So, these balloon, poppy, touchy games, I don't even remember what they're called, they're, that's how little I care about them. They're not good. They're basically just these slow on-rail sections where you drag the stylus around to move the camera and tap the balloons to pop them. 
that's it. It's like a one to kick up the exhaust. I mean, for one, there's no actual racing involved, and for two, I mean, it's everything else. There's nothing right about this. The worst part is that it replaces the silver coin challenges, which may have been a little difficult at times, but at least they were proper races. Their absence from the natural progression loop really makes me realise just how natural they really were. After playing through all the tracks normally, playing through them again with an additional challenges, like the silver coins, feels right. Mate, why have four rounds of racing when you could just disrupt the entire loop with a boggy slow set of levels that have nothing in common with the rest of the game? Now, between the first and second time you face the boss of the world, there isn't a single race to be had. And then they go ahead and leave the silver coin challenges in as an optional side activity. It's insulting, it really is. Nobody did the silver coin challenges because they wanted to do them, they did them because they had to, but they didn't complain because they felt like they belonged. The content that's been replaced is still there, sure, but the capacity to which it's been implemented is frankly embarrassing. All of the new gimmicky shit only gets in the way of the thing that players actually want to do in Diddy Kong Racing. Race. It's unnecessary and it bogs everything down, and I have absolutely no desire to play through any of it when I know that the stuff I actually want to get to is entirely inconsequential and optional anyway. A balloon game, you get all the strikes. Strikes 2 through 14. F*** you, f*** your balloons, and f*** 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 And I haven't even talked about the battle modes replacement, wish races yet. Not that there's much to talk about anyway. Once you collect a world's hidden key, you'll now unlock access to the world's wish race trial, where you have to beat TT in a track of your own doing. For the first three worlds, you're basically stuck drawing a predefined circuit, but once you hit Dragon Forest or purchase the wish race mode from the wish menu, you're given free reign to draw the most complicated, or... course you want. I mean, it's, it's fine, I guess. Aside from drawing your track, there isn't a whole lot of extra customization to be found, so don't go in expecting some totally robust custom course designer. The actual tracks themselves are also much too thin to really allow for you to use any of your skill here, and seeing as this is the only place in the entire game where you can fall out of bounds, the respawn animation looks pretty terrible. Or at least I assume it would if they had remembered to add it. It's easily the most seamless combination of actual gameplay and touch gimmicks in the entire game, but again, it's just the issue of replacing a feature that didn't need replacing. Why not include a Wish Race game mode alongside the battle tracks? I mean, it's already available for unlock in the Wish menu, so why not leave it there if it really has to exist at all? Also, the entire point of grabbing the keys in this version of the game is to free TT, who's trapped behind the door, so why is he racing me? Why do you have to make it so complicated, dude? You're a f***ing clock, how am I supposed to tell the time if you keep running away from me? Of course, we aren't quite done with the gimmicks just yet. This is a Nintendo game after all, so if the rules of three applies everywhere else, it sure as hell can apply here too. So after clearing the world, you'll be able to return to the boss and face it a third time in a special touch challenge trial. The specifics of each challenge vary between bosses, but for the most part, they involve some sort of horribly inaccurate control scheme that primarily utilises the touchscreen for no other reason than because it's there. Blue's race is probably the least painful and simply involves steering a hovercraft that's had its accelerator nailed down while tapping obstacles on the touchscreen to destroy them. <laughs> Next in line is the only other one I could be bothered to finish, Trickies, in which you have to go all Yoshi's fruit cart and draw a path for your car to follow. Now this wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the fact that the car's running on a lawnmower engine has to be kickstarted by spinning this wheel in the corner of the screen every 8 seconds. Not a problem on a straightaway, but anyone who's ever seen Tricky's race knows that the entire thing is one big spiral. So when you constantly have to move your stylus away from telling the car where to go and spin the wheel, flying over the edge is all but guaranteed at least a few times. Bubbler's Touch Challenge is pretty much the same as Tricky's, except it's in a slippy hovercraft with race-ruining bubble hazards littered all over the place. So after all the pain Tricky's inflicted, I honestly couldn't justify spending any more than one heart palpitation on it. Neither of these compare to Smokey's Race, however, with a control scheme so absurd, so dire, that I am now fully convinced nobody actually worked on this game and that it was nothing more than a creation of God to punish us for our mortal sins. What you're supposed to do here is drag the control stick on the bottom screen to steer the plane. The hypersensitive, double axis dude, impossible to control in most other circumstances, let alone one with a thin piece of plastic, plane. Honestly, words cannot express just how awful this control scheme is. How can anyone have thought this was a good idea? There's no hidden reason as to why it shouldn't exist, it just doesn't work. And the fact that anybody thought it did even slightly is an insult to a game that so many have such high regards for. 
It's almost as if Nintendo just took the easiest IP they could find and stuffed it full of gimmicks to try and earn a quick buck. Except that theory doesn't even make any sense because it wasn't an easy IP to work with. So what gives? These touch challenges aren't even forced into the regular gameplay loop like the balloon shooters or the wish races are, but that still doesn't excuse the fact that they don't actually provide any substance whatsoever. You do get a large money cash prize from the bosses if you manage to complete any of them, and at the very least, the way they talk to you after you beat them will never fail to make me laugh. No, <laughs> you beat me again! Please, take my money! <laughs> it's like I'm mugging them, it's sort of therapeutic in a way. To be fair though, I shouldn't be ragging on the controls of a stupid touchscreen side game where the controls in the main racing segments aren't even right either. After having played so many modern races, going back to the controls in the original N64 version of Diddy Kong Racing was admittedly a bit of a shock. At first the controls can feel quite loose and imprecise, especially with the hovercraft or plane, but do not be fooled by the cutesy graphics into thinking that it's just a product of the past. Diddy Kong Racing is actually quite a technical kart racer when you really get into it, with plenty of little tricks you can learn to make your time a lot easier. First of all, it's important to note that the turning on your car seems to be controlled by the front wheels, which will always feel a little strange, but more than makes up for it by allowing you to swing your back out to hit boosts at the last second or quickly avoid obstacles. It's a little tricky to explain, but trust me, it's a pretty damn powerful one once you know how to take advantage of it. On top of the whole letting go of A before hitting a zipper or using the hovercraft's hop to quickly make sharp turns, you can also hold B while drifting to slide into an even sharper, almost 90 degree drift without losing speed. It's an incredibly helpful move that once mastered can help you grab some of those harder to reach coins and pull off some really great shortcuts. Hell, you can even use a similar move in the plane, and I can't even begin to tell you how many times that knowledge saved me a restart with some of the later plane-based missions. Once I learned about these moves, it suddenly made a lot more sense as to why the controls... God damn it, why can't I say controls like a normal f***ing person? Once I learned about this move, it suddenly made a lot more sense as to why the controls felt so loose at first, so that you, the player, can make them more precise whenever you need to. Once you've got the controls down in this game, they're easily some of the tightest around. It's great for experts, but I can definitely see it turning people that don't want to commit to learning them away. In order to appeal to more of a casual audience, the DS port opts to present a much simpler, more precise control style from the get-go. Certain tricks, such as the super boost, have been nerfed considerably, while moves like the extra sharp drift have been removed completely. Overall, the controls are a lot smoother, short, but much clunkier overall. And plus, not being able to perform this sharper drift sort of breaks some tracks, such as with the chicane at the end of Greenwood Village, which now forces you to slow down if you want to get around it without crashing, instead of drifting to quickly glide through it. It's great for casuals, I suppose, uh, but overall it just creates this really clunky control scheme that sort of feels unfinished in a way. You can tell it's been dialed back. I feel like Nintendo must have known this too, because in order to facilitate this, they've committed the worst crime of all. They made Diddy Kong Racing... Easy. This is especially apparent when you're up against a CPU in a regular race. Not that there's much of that to be found anymore, but the places where you really feel it is the boss races. Tricky no longer knocks over any giant pillars right at the start of his race. I mean, both matches are now basically the same now. Bubbler doesn't use his signature bubble move until the second match. Same goes for Smokey with his fireballs. And even when they do use them, they pose significantly less of a hazard. And Bluey no longer wears a bib and now has a general air which resembles that of an elderly man with rickets. They all do, in fact. They're so goddamn slow now that I'm honestly wondering why they showed up to race in the first place. None of them even do that thing where they take off before the countdown is even over anymore, which means you can basically overtake them right at the start of the race. Even Whizpig is easy now. Whizpig! One attempt it took me! One! Compared to the 8,000 hours it took me in the original. There's not even any option to change the difficulty of the CPU in versus races. Don't get me wrong, the original didn't really provide that either, but at least A, the CPU provided even a semblance of challenge to begin with anyway, and B, there are a handful of cheat codes you could use to raise it if you wanted, which the DS doesn't have anymore, by the way. How am I supposed to enjoy this game if I can't be slightly larger, huh? That's not a problem I should have to solve. Honestly, aside from the touch challenges, I don't think I lost an entire race all game. Like, come on, the original had a tendency to be unnecessarily difficult, but at least that inspired some sort of satisfaction when you finally managed to overcome a particularly challenging course. Here, you just sort of coast through every race where everyone tells you how great of a job you did. Like, fine, okay, I, I didn't want to switch my brain on today anyway. Ugh, let's give that some strikes. Uh, uh, what are we at, 14? Ugh, man, I lost count at this point. Just give them another 12. Uh, I'm sure they're all covered at some point. Now, another thing you might have remembered me mentioning about the original Diddy Kong Racing was the music, specifically how fantastic it was. So if you haven't caught the pattern yet, that means I'm going to now compare it to the port. So all in all, my feelings when it comes to the music in this game are a lot more positive than most everything else it has going against it, to a certain degree. 
Now, to start off, let's get the elephant in the room out of the room. Obviously, the built-in deer speakers are not great, and this definitely has an impact on how most of the tracks sound. Everything here sounds a lot crunchier, if that makes sense, and certain tracks like Frosty Village or even Everfrost Peak can be downright ear-piercing at times. The sound font that Diddy Kong Racing DS uses is almost identical to that of the original, but ever so slightly, how do you say, worse. Most tracks are pretty faithful, which is fantastic, but all of them have been remixed to different degrees. None of them are necessarily bad, but they all somehow sound a bit less satisfying now. Case in point, Dark Moon Caverns, which now sounds like it's building up to something the entire time without ever actually going anywhere. rather than doing what the original did and, you know, actually just building up to the middle of the track. As negative as I'm sounding, I really should say that none of it is bad. It still all sounds all right, I'd just much rather listen to the original renditions. Oh, and hey, speaking of original renditions, there are actually some here. I especially love how the lobby music now has a whopping 23 variants, one for almost every course in the game to play on the race results screen. The Wish Race music is also a total bop, with four different variants each themed after one of the first four worlds, all of which sound fantastic and really feel like they belong alongside all the greats from the original. On top of that, every level in the DS port now has its own original theme. That means no more double ups. There's only about five brand new track themes, but every single one is fantastic as well. Windmill Plains and Spaceport Alpha's new themes I actually prefer over the original tracks. They're just that good. Pyro Lagoon's new theme is also amazing. But it doesn't quite live up to the original Treasure Caves music. Uh, but to be fair, not a lot does. So where the f is it? You know Treasure Caves, right? Even if you haven't played Diddy Kong Racing, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if you're familiar with the OG Treasure Caves theme. It's easily one of the most iconic pieces David Wise has ever composed, so why is it not in the remake? For some really odd, dare I say absurd reason, both tracks that use this piece in the original have had completely new themes composed for them, effectively erasing the original tune. Jungle Falls, another one of my favourite track themes from the original. Actually shares a similar fate. although its sloppy Bit Crush remix is still heard during the credits, much like it was in the original. Treasure Caves doesn't even get that kindness though, with its theme completely absent from the game, thereby being the only tune from the original to end up that way. Any other track and I might have been fine with it, but Treasure Caves... Uh, frankly, I want to hear the Treasure Caves theme in more games, not less. I just, I don't understand why you are so... <sighs> Mia, get down! Get ready! Sorry. No! No, no, no! 
Especially in the goddamn game it came from. Seriously, who made that decision and how do you sleep at night? All in all, the music on offer here isn't terrible, aside from a heaping handful of remasters that take on the Sonic 3, Sonic Origins approach and be sh**. There are some legitimately really good tracks on offer that I genuinely wasn't expecting. Uh, but it's my video and I'm still angry, so it's all null and void, actually. Well, I'm still complaining because I guess I didn't expect to be doing any more of that. I sort of have this laundry list of complaints, so, you know, I'm just gonna rattle off a few real quick and you can do what you want with that. And you know, best of all, we'll put the treasure f***ing caves over the top, because that's the least we could do, this is- I'm going off script. It is off script, I'm angry. I didn't- I, this has been so long since I wrote this, and now I'm just- it's all coming back to me in waves. It's waves, this is a deleted scene, Patreon. Follow me, subscribe today. Some tracks have been completely decimated in the shift to make the game easier. The first Whizpig race is now considerably narrower throughout, and feels more like you're driving through a diorama for some reason. The track's also set during the day now, which completely ruins the ambience and removes any last shred of intensity this race had. Star Star City now has this little passageway underneath the building in the ramp section at the start of the race, which now means that if you fall off said ramp, you don't have to just lay down and die. Which I guess is technically a good thing, but maybe after playing this remake, laying down and dying is sort of what I felt like doing anyway. In the original, my favourite track, Spaceport Alpha, had this really fun corridor towards the end where you had to avoid a barrage of oncoming lasers. For no reason whatsoever, this remake removes the lasers from this bit, so now you're just left with this long, empty hallway that serves no purpose whatsoever. I don't want to say it ruins the track, but it definitely ruins the track. And while we're on the topic of lasers, actually, all of the similar projectiles have been removed from the throne room in Whizpig's second race, effectively screwing one of the most intense parts of the entire track, and even invalidating any sort of strategic item management you had to do in the original. Speaking of items, popping a balloon of a different colour no longer replaces it, which now makes it way too easy to get overpowered items without any skill. There's also these strange upgrade tokens scattered around in difficult to reach places on the map, which you can apply to any held items powered up even more. I tried doing this with a boost power up a few times and it didn't do anything when I actually deployed it. Uh, so, I mean, that was a fun point in my life. The last two red balloon upgrades have been swapped as well, so instead of going single missile, homing missile, 10 missiles, it's single missile, 5 missiles, homing missiles. I don't get this change. It only makes obliterating your opponent in boss fights even easier. Deploying an oil slick in the original made a really fun squelch sound. Not anymore! This port was so rough that Diddy Kong's gone and gotten addicted to scratches as a result. Hitting ground boost in a plane is significantly easier here, making the plane even more unbalanced than it was already. At one point, Targe gave me this challenge where I had to travel to two nearby areas around the island and use my breath to extinguish a couple torches. Not really sure why. Uh, I guess Nintendo just hadn't hit their microphone usage quota yet. Drawing logos is a thing you can do, just like in Mario Kart DS. You can even put your logo on the billboards around each track, but that would require playing the game enough to earn the right amount of money to unlock it. You also can't get a boost at the start of the race by holding A anymore. Instead, you have to either aggressively use the touchscreen to spin the wheel or propeller in the car or plane, or aggressively blow into the microphone and pass out before the race starts. <laughs> That's funny. That's a funny line. <laughs> or aggressively blow into the microphone and pass out before the race starts for the hovercraft. Yet another case of gimmick winning again. whoop de doo This. Yeah, that. Oh, and anything you can interact with through the touchscreen in the hub world is signaled via this uncomfortably realistic hand icon, and I can only wish that I counted the number of times I emerge from a race to be greeted by this awful Frankenclock abomination. Ooh, okay, uh, it is nice to have all that off my chest, I'll tell you. Now that we're done with complaining as well, we can finally get to the one redeeming feature of Diddy Kong Racing DS. The one thing that has the power to make this version worthwhile. The new tracks. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, um, I did think they were gonna be better than that. So Diddy Kong Racing introduces four new tracks which can be purchased via Targe's Wish menu. Thunder Cove, Meandering Mount, Splashdown Pass, and Strangled Shrine. If you can't tell by looking, all of these tracks are heavily inspired by the Donkey Kong series, and generally speaking, they aren't that bad. Thunder Cove is a pretty simple jungle track with a nice mix of open areas, narrow parts, straightaways, curvy bits. I, I mean, it's a race track, how else should I describe it? Splashdown Pass is pretty similar, with a few split paths for the car and hovercraft, but also suffers from a rare condition known as eyesorgitis. Side effects include being very boring to look at. Meandering Mount is much more interesting though, notable for being one of the curviest tracks in the game. The most interesting feature here though has got to be the mine entrances littered around the side of the track. Most of them are a little tricky to get into, but if you can manage it, you can potentially shave off a lot of time on your run. Not every mineshaft is helpful though. 
Will you end up cutting it short or will you end up back where you started? Who knows? It's a mystery. I, I mean, you could just look at the sign above the door actually before you go in, but oh, mystery. Last but not least, and my favorite of the four, Strangled Shrine. I'm a big fan of the abandoned temple theme it's got going on and it feels like a bit of a better boulder canyon, so I'm all for that. Plus the music here is quite good too, and the fact that it sounds relatively different from anything else in the game, as opposed to the other three tracks relatively generic themes, is a nice bonus. Like I said, these tracks are fine and all, and it's good to see an addition with any substance at all, but I definitely remember enjoying them a lot more than I did today. I don't know, maybe it's because I was more aware of the game's shortcomings, maybe it's because they're just not that good, maybe it's because I have brain damage and don't know what to think anymore, who knows? With all that said and done though in what has to be my longest video to date, do these four new tracks make up for every other issue? Is it worth playing Diddy Kong Racing DS just to experience these four new courses? Heck, is it even worth playing Diddy Kong Racing DS at all? F*** no, what do you think, I have brain damage? Of course it isn't. If Diddy Kong Racing DS was stripped of all the stupid gimmicky touchy stuff and I could actually play the battle modes, then sure, it might well be. And if it actually had a bit of challenge to go with it, then it'd easily be the definitive version to grab. But it isn't, so avoid it. Like, I don't know, the, the monkey bee virus. <coughs> Honestly, I went into Diddy Kong Racing DS excited to play, but let's just say I was clamoring to get back to the original ASAP about halfway through. Hell, I didn't even finish it. Instead, I went back and played around in 64 for a bit because, you know, even though it mightn't seem like I do, I do enjoy fun. Diddy Kong Racing was, and still is, one of the most inventive, charming, and downright amusing kart races of all time. But Diddy Kong Racing DS somehow managed to botch all of that and provide a crash course in how to suck and Everything that made the original so great is here and more, but it's the way it's presented and the capacity to which it's implemented alongside the and more that makes all the new stuff seem so slow and redundant. Including all the things that made it great in the first place is all well and good, but if half of it is secondary to all the newer boggy stuff, then it can only result in a slower, less fulfilling experience that would be much better without it. Of all the features on offer here, the new unlockable characters, the wish races, and the four new tracks are the only things even remotely worth your time. But they are absolutely not worth trudging through all the other bullshit this sorry excuse for a port throws at you. Who knows, maybe you're one of the few people out there who legitimately enjoys Diddy Kong Racing DS. And hey, you know, that's cool. I'll respect it. Even without any comparison, Diddy Kong Racing DS still falls flat in more than a few areas, however. So if you're looking for the purest possible Diddy Kong Racing experience, you definitely won't find it here. Diddy Kong Racing is an incredibly unique kart racer in the sense that it wasn't drawing from any source material. It had its own original style that you can only get from Diddy Kong Racing. So it almost seems wrong that it never had the chance to become a full-blown franchise. As we all know though, Nintendo has a tendency to hold the future of franchises by a thread. If anything, it's more like they turn off the lights, grab the first object they stumbled into, tied that to the thread, and never turn the lights back on to check whether it was actually the franchise or something totally different they tied to the thread. I I'm pretty sure this analogy has gotten away from me at this point, but what I'm trying to say is that Nintendo is really good at giving their fans exactly what they don't want, sometimes. Chibi Robo and Star Fox, two beloved franchises that were unjustly murdered after Nintendo crammed them full of inane gimmicks to suit their own agenda. Uh, even though I do like Star Fox Zero, I just want to make that clear, I think it's a fun game, it's not the best, but it is fun. I mean, look at this. Now look at this. Now what reason could possibly exist that would explain why fans of this game could ever want to possibly purchase this game? There's a good reason so many people, even a good portion of Diddy Kong Racing fans, don't know that this port even exists. None of the gimmicks they've added to this game add anything of value to the experience. Even just releasing a direct port with minimal changes would have been more worthwhile for everyone involved. But because of their constant urge to utilize every piece of hardware they have just to show that they're quirky and different instead of using it meaningfully, they blew it. And considering Nintendo is the reason Rare's in such shambles today, maybe it's what they deserved. Not what we deserve, though. I didn't deserve it. I want Diddy Kong Racing. God f***ing damn it, Nintendo. Uh, but also f Microsoft, too. Nobody's good enough for this game. Look, honestly, I don't even really know what the point of this video was. Was it to tell you how good Diddy Kong Racing is? Was it to tell you how bad Diddy Kong Racing DS is? Was it to convince you to buy a Nintendo 64 and play it? To show you how long I can ramble like I can complete gobsh for? As an assessment for ADHD? 
a proof of my descent into madness and inability to let people enjoy what they want. Hey, I don't know. I'm just a guy who enjoys Diddy Kong racing, never revises a draft, and loves a fair go. What else is there to say? Ah, here we go. My steak. Finally. What? No, what? No, hold on. This is a highly efficient, super sustainable Pearl 700 Rolls-Royce business jet combustion engine. I asked for a steak. Wait, who even are... Oh, Nintendo. Oh, oh my God, you got me. You got me. You did it again. You, you, uh, no, but for real, uh, Diddy Kong Racing DS is an atrocity. Just a sort of all round. Uh, this is the end of the video, by the way. You can leave now. I don't have a, I don't have a joke or anything. Unless you want to count the entire goddamn video. Ayo!